many of us believed going into the Big 12 season that this was the the program probably long term, but more specifically 2023, the program best equipped to compete immediately. We've seen pockets of that, but there has also been uh, some obvious issues uh, with UCF adapting. Yeah, it's the biggest issue that I that I that UCF faces right now, as we've seen, is injuries. Um, you know, when John Rice Plumley went down um, with that injury in the Boise State game, a game that, you know, UCF won, but should have won by a considerably larger margin than they did due to some really silly errors. Um, you know, that was a real uh, that was a real blow um, because you know, he's one of the most electrifying players, uh, not just that we've had in a long time here at UCF, but, you know, it, that it really in in the conference. And we really believe that. Um, you know, a credit to Timmy McLean, um, the seminal, uh, seminal high school product, uh, locally from Sanford, who has filled in admirably, uh, for, for JRP, but, um, it's, you know, it's just, it, the offense just isn't, isn't quite the same without JRP's experience back there. Um, you know, he was out for, um, the Kansas state game, a game that, you know, was pretty tight. Uh, into the fourth quarter until Kansas State put it away. Um, the Baylor game, I mean, what can you possibly say about that? That hasn't already been said. Um, that, that's a game that UCF is going to look back on for years and be like, we should have had that one. Um, and, uh, you know, the Kansas game, you know, the, the JRP tried to give it a ride. He had that knee brace out there, and you could tell after, I think, the third possession, he was just like, I just don't have it today. And uh, I thought I had it. I, I wanted to give it a shot. We didn't have it. And then by that time, Kansas, who I think is a very good football team, um, you know, the, McLean came in. The offense kind of heated up later. But, you know, there was a point there, Mark, where UCF gave up 60 unanswered points between the second half of the Baylor game and the first half of the Kansas game. And that's just not going to do it. Um, you know, coming off of a bye week, just like Oklahoma is, the hope is that, Plumley is healthy and ready to go. So we'll see what happens with him on offense. Got uh, Jeff Sharon here breaking down UCF football for us. Of course, uh, the uh, opponent, the Knights for uh, Oklahoma coming up this week. And as Jeff had alerted me, because I did not look at the point spread yet, 19 points is the line uh, for these two teams coming into it. So sitting at... What is the record? Three and three? Oh, three and three. three in the Big 12. I got to think just reaching postseason play is the goal. Yeah. I mean, that, for, I've always thought that that was basically the goal from the very beginning. I, you know, some, I know you'd mentioned that some people thought that UCF was equipped to compete right away in the Big 12. I think they would have needed a lot of, a lot of dominoes to fall their way if they were going to, if UCF was going to compete for the Big 12 championship right off the bat. And the main, reason for that is something that we've talked about before when UCF is in the American is depth. You know, depth is, uh, is, is, you know, UCF has proven in the past that they can compete on a level with you know, teams like Auburn and Georgia back in the, you know, beat Georgia in the bowl game, beat Baylor in our first BCS game that's 10 years ago already. Um, but as you said, you know, if you, you know, when you get into the grind and guys start getting hurt, you've got to have that depth in your back pocket. And right now they just haven't, not just offensively. I talked about John Rice Plumlee, but also defensively, Ricky Barber, who's probably, you know, might be our best defensive tackle right now, um, has been fighting through some injuries. We've had some injuries on the offensive line as well. We've had to change centers. We have had to move some things around. And uh, and it's a pretty tough situation, you know, right now. But you know, I, I can tell you the truth, like I mentioned earlier, Nobody has needed this bye week more than UCF right now, just in an attempt to try and get healthy before they head out to Norman for the first time. As I mentioned off the top, Oklahoma fans have been celebrating the bye week. Just they, it's given them an extra week to to relish in the in the Texas win. We're glad to be joined by our guy Jason Ray, who hosts our post game show here at the Voice of College Football OU, and also Sooner Tailgate every week. Jeff, Jason, Jason, Jeff. Uh, Jeff writes for you. Uh, UCF Banneret on uh, SB Nation, Jason. So I'll let you guys break down the matchup coming up. So Jason, dive right in. 
Uh, yeah, I think it's an interesting matchup, really specifically when you even when you when you take out the point spread and even even at that. I think when you look at UCF, they've been very dynamic rushing the ball this year. I think third nationally overall, um, and where they're at, Oklahoma offensively has relied on the pass a little bit more. Number four overall in, in passing yards in the, in the country. So, I think looking at both of those sides, whichever whichever one is really able to. Um, to, to, to kind of show their worth in terms of um, who's able to, to run the ball better or throw the ball better certainly has a big advantage. Obviously, I think coming in Oklahoma, um, which is, you know, very, Jeff, very rare for Oklahoma to be able to say this, but I think now this year Oklahoma comes in with, with a much better defense. I think UCF looks, looks a lot like where Oklahoma I think was last year, um, struggling to stop the run. I know that uh, you kind of mentioned mentioned here about the bye week, and I and I, my apologies, I caught caught the middle of it, but I was very surprised that Kansas was able to do what they were able to do on the ground, specifically to the tune of almost 400 yards. So, I think Oklahoma's not necessarily been in position from a running game perspective to um, take advantage of that. Previously, surprisingly, at least for me, Oklahoma was able to run for 200 yards against uh, against Texas. I know a lot of that was was from the quarterback run game from. Um, Dylan Gabriel being able to uh, to run for over 100 yards in that game, so I, I think that's interesting. And I think for me, uh, there's there's a few different I, I would call intangible things that are that are part of this part of this matchup, right? When you when you look at Oklahoma now after a week off the bye week, the victory against Texas, Oklahoma's in the top ten, was number five last week, number six. I think the for the first time in the last two years under Brent Venables, Oklahoma is more back to where they are accustomed to and being uh, the hunted versus being kind of the hunter. You know, there's not, there's been a lot of people, as Mark had mentioned, there's a lot, there was a lot of celebration um, for, I think even you could make an argument a bit too long, um, you know, for, for that Texas game. So how, how do they, how do they come back knowing, okay, this is not a team that's fighting for, uh, to be an upper level bowl team versus you know being six and seven last year. This is a team I think right now in front of them based on the schedule has a real shot at winning a Big 12 championship and has a real shot of potentially getting to the college football playoffs. So how do they handle that different? Whether it be internally with within the team in and of itself, how do the coaching staff um, handle that coming in? Um, I know that there's the, the Dylan Gabriel dynamic with with UCF and, and what that looks like. I don't know. You know, if there's really much to that, I'll, once the once the game actually gets kicked off and um, and things like that. But no, I think it's it's a very interesting matchup. US, UCF really just kind of getting, um, I think their bearings in terms of what Big Twelve play what are what Power Five uh, football looks like each and every week. Um, you know, versus what they've been used to in the in, in the. Uh, in the Amer- in the Americans, so um, very intriguing matchup to see where um, uh, to where both of these teams um, line up. And I, I know that you'd mentioned the bye week. I think the bye week was very big for Oklahoma as well. A couple of injuries. Um, we t- I talked a little bit about the passing game. Oklahoma's leading wide receiver Andrew Anthony out for the year um, with an ACL injury. So what what does that receiving core look like? And, and it's a group that that's been a lot better than, than I think we thought most people thought coming into the year. Um, but still having, having said that, you know, that depth takes a little bit of a hit with that and, and, and interested to see who steps up, what that looks like. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think the, like the biggest thing for me is the, is really kind of the, the differentiator between what Oklahoma was perceived nationally and maybe even locally as well with the, with the Oklahoma media um, before Texas versus after Texas. So how do they handle that um, in, in terms of, you know, what that looks like, not only for this game, but going forward? Yeah, I, I Jason, I, I for one thought that Oklahoma was uh, should have been the favorite in the Big 12 coming into this year. I mean, I know I, I, I mean, everyone talked about Texas, but. You know, no one knows Dylan Gabriel other than you guys better than us. Um, yeah, the, his talent is undeniable. 
Um, now you mentioned, you know, th that you were surprised about how, you know, UCF really struggled defending the run against Kansas and Kansas State. I'm really not because, you know, those are the, two, you know, 12th, Kansas State's 12th in the country in rushing and Kansas and Kansas is 13th. And I, and I think Kansas is still a dark horse to, to, to sneak into the conference championship game. They are well coached with Lance Leipold. And I, th and I, I was, I was less surprised at that game. I think anybody else, but, um, you know, if you're looking at this game from, you know, an intangible perspective, I mean, let's face it, this is UCF against Dylan Gabriel. Like, uh, you know, if, if you know, and I, and I know the players and coaches are going to be, you know, they're going to say the right things, right. You know, you know, this is just, Oh, he's just the opposing core, right? Yeah. We really appreciate what he did here and everything, but you know, once the, once the whistle blows, you know, cliche, 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 yada, yada come on. You and I both know that there are some guys who are left over from, who remember the, the 2021 season and how it all went down with Dylan, where, where UCF, you know, he got hurt in the Louisville game, which was a, a, a spleen rupturing loss. Um, and then it was thought that he would be able to come back and maybe help UCF make a run to the American championship in the very end. They were right there at the end. Mikey Keene, who's now at Fresno state did a great job filling in for him. And, he didn't. And then the day after the final regular season game against USF, he announces he's leaving initially remember for UCLA. And then he decided to go to Oklahoma and follow Jeff Levy, who was an assistant here as well. Um, there are still some guys for whom that memory is quite fresh, I think. And uh, will it have an impact on the game for it for or against either side? I don't know but it's a factor and it's a fun that it's a fun thing that we can talk about here. But um, you know, yeah, you mentioned, you know, it, it, Oklahoma with the rush, you know, has been attacking via the pass this year, uh, not as strong against the run UCF's weakness against the run, but I think it, it has been apparent, but I think that the real issue for UCF is, they've they have not been able to force turnovers they, they it, and that's been true the last couple of years they're they're near the bottom of the fbs and uh not just turnover margin but turnovers force they've only forced five turnovers in six games this year and they have got to turn that around because you know as we know the way ucf and gus malzahn like to run their offense if that's got to, if, if that's going to work they have to get extra possessions and force the and turn the other team over in order to get that. And so far, they haven't been able to do that. Will they be able to do that against the number one team in FBS and turnover margin this year? I don't know. Stranger things have happened. Jeff, uh, when you look at UCF's adjustment period to the Big 12, and, and again, it sounds like uh, at the, the outset of our conversation that you had no great grand illusions of what UCF is going to be initially in the big 12. Uh, and, and again, I do think that most people thought not that they would compete for a conference championship, but that they would be the most competitive of the four coming into the league initially. Has it been more uh, the substandard play more on UCF, not being what they've been in the past injuries, taking a toll substandard play, some guys not coming through as expected, or has it been more about the Big 12 maybe being a tougher league than you and others anticipated? It's easy to say it's a little bit of both. I think that it's really an issue of, like you were talking about, depth and injuries. Um, it, you know, it's for it, the, the week in, week out grind, I thought, you know, we've talked about like all the different angles since 2017 when UCF went undefeated and beat Gus Malzahn and Auburn in the in the Peach Bowl. Um, you know, it's of course, you know, a team at that level, at the group of five level could beat a power five, a good power five team, you know, in a one off situation, you know, with enough preparation. No problem. It's the week in, week out grind that makes it tough. And what happens, you know, with your and what happens with your depth when your top guys get banged up? Do you have guys behind him that can step in and and keep the level of play high? Uh, I think that that's that's really the one issue. And there's and and credit to Gus Malzahn, who has recruited better than any, the, the, the best classes that UCF has ever seen over his three years in preparation for this moment. But that doesn't happen overnight. That doesn't even happen over the course of two nights, 
for two years, really. It takes a full recruiting cycle and sometimes more than one for that to actually happen. Um, we saw, ever, you know, we, and, and I think that the administration at UCF understands that. That's why they signed Gus Malzahn to an extension through 2027 earlier this year. The news actually broke right after the Baylor game in a rather inconvenient fashion, considering how that game played out. But, um, but, you know, it, but he had signed that extension, you know, in, in the summer. And that's a real commitment to the idea that, hey, we're, we're in this thing for the long haul. Um, that said, you know, I, I had, you know, I had thought from the very beginning, like, you know, do, you know, let's, let's see how this all plays out. I think I thought that the goal was get to a bowl game, you know, and, 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 and you know, are you going to surprise some people? Yeah. Are we going to have some tough times against some opponents? Yeah. So far we've had a lot of tough times against opponents, but um, I think that the, the way that the schedule is working out the bye week right smack dab in the middle of the season, um, you know, I, I think that with some of our upcoming home games, it should shake out well for UCF to get to that six win plateau, get to, you know, become bowl eligible. And let's see what happens from there. I think that would be that should be a, that should be considered a first year in the big in a power five conference, a pretty successful first year, especially when you go back and take a look at, like, for example, what TCU did in their first year in the Big 12, what Utah did in their first year in the Pac-12. Those are the two most recent um, entrance from the group of five into the power of five, they struggled and it took them a while, but they figured it out. And I think UCF does have the infrastructure and the administrative commitment to make that happen in the long term. The only problem is the long term is the long term. It's not the short term, you know. So, um, so it takes it takes time. And yeah, I get I get that fans are impatient considering also how successful we've been over the last few years, but. Give it time, folks. We've only been playing football since 1979. Do you tend to take a peek back at the American Conference and think, well, I wonder what we'd be doing this season in the American? Oh, no, no. I'm happy to be in the Big 12. Believe me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to, you know, I, I mean, it's, it, 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 listen, playing the likes of Baylor, Oklahoma, you know, Kansas, Kansas State, we got Oklahoma State coming into our house uh, in, in a couple of weeks, you know, or, or in a few weeks. We've got, um, you know, we're matching back up against Cincinnati. We got a trip out to Lubbock. That beats the living daylights out of playing North Texas and Rice in South Florida. Believe me, any day of the week and twice on Saturday. I, I heard that shot on South Florida at the end there. You included them. I have to get one in. Come on. You know I have to get one Are, in. are they going to be part of the non-conference schedule going forward? Uh, it's very hard to say. There have been some inklings that, you know, perhaps maybe one day we can renew this. We can renew the war on I-4. But the main issue behind that is their schedule is filled out for the next four, I think, four or five years. And now that we're in the Big 12 and playing nine conference games instead of eight, which which UCF used to in the American, that actually that takes away one more slot where we probably could have could have fit them in. So um, if if it does renew itself, it won't be for a while. Jeff, for Oklahoma fans, uh, anyone that they should be looking out for uh, in, in this matchup because they're probably pretty unfamiliar with the Knights. Couple guys, I, I want to start on offense. You know, we we've heard a lot about John Rice Plumley, of course, who came over from Ole Miss, um, and has really made tremendous was really making tremendous strides in year two before that injury against Boise. Really was making really had made huge strides in year two. Um, R.J. Harvey, primary running back threat, he's just a workhorse back there for UCF. Um, but I think that, you know, the, the guys who really, I think, stir the drink are the wide receivers on the outside. Javon Baker, Kobe Hudson. If those guys are able to get free in the secondary, things could get really interesting. Defensively, it, I, I, I have been just blown away at how, at the kind of season that Traymond Morris Brash has been having. Um, go back and look at the Boise film. Um, he is a one-man wrecking crew. And the the we we charted it. We charted it in the second. It, you know that whole game, wherever Traymon Morris Brash was on that blue field, Boise was like, "We're not going that way. 
we're going the opposite way of him because he's going to he's going to wreak absolute havoc on us, and he has been so far um, to this point. Um, yeah, and he's going to and he's going to have to do that again and make Dylan Gabriel's life a living hell if UCF is going to have any chance uh, against Norman uh, in Norman against Oklahoma. Jason, uh, anything else for Jeff? Uh, yeah, I mean, the only thing I think that probably the biggest burning question from from Oklahoma's side is what the what the health of the quarterback situation is. I know that uh, Gus Malzahn has, has announced that uh, John Rice Plumley will start this weekend against Oklahoma. Whether you where do you feel like he is health wise coming into this game? Very hard to say because Gus is notoriously good at keeping the wraps on the injury news. We didn't we didn't even have any idea that JRP would start the Kansas game until all of a sudden, you know, he was he was actually heading out. There's actually we didn't really even know about what was going on at the bit. We thought that he would be back this game that for this game that they would keep him out through the bye week and then he would be ready for Oklahoma. And then he comes out in full pads and uniform for the Baylor game. And we were like, what is this? Why is he why is he dressed for this game? Yeah. Um, and then uh, he got the start in the Kansas game, but you could tell those first, you know, the first possession, he just it it he just didn't have it. And yeah. he met and on the I think on the third possession of the game, he missed a dump off throw to RJ Harvey. And he went and he went right back to the sidelines and got on the phone, and you could tell he was telling you know, Darren Hinshaw up in the box. He's like, look, I gave it, I gave it my best here. I, I, I don't have it today. You got to get Timmy in there. Yeah. Uh, Timmy McLean, the backup quarterback. So, um, you know, and, and credit to him for the leadership on that. You know, he, you know, he's, he's, he's no fool on that. Um, two weeks out, you know, they, that's two more weeks for that injury to heal. Um, he was out there in a full knee brace. We have not seen what he looks like, at least as of right now, uh, in terms of if he's wearing something smaller, does he look, does he look more mobile out there? We don't know. Um, it, but the one thing that we know is that his mobility is going to be key. He is a quintessential dual threat guy. Um, and those legs are the real threat. Um, to what extent, you know, to what percentage he's going to have that running ability back right now is anybody's guess. I guess we're going to find out, you know, 11 o'clock central uh, uh, on Saturday. All right. Anything else, Jason? Um, no, I mean, I, th- I guess the only thing it's just interesting. I think the parallels with it with in this game with these two teams, as you as you mentioned, uh, UCF is. It's, it's kind of interesting. UCF is tickled pink to be in the Big 12. Very, very happy. Whereas I think Oklahoma's of the perspective is we can't get out of this conference fast enough. And I don't think it's anything more – I don't think it's anything specifically just um, derogatory derogatory about the Big 12. I just think the excitement of Oklahoma being in the, in the SEC. And I think Texas is even, even the same way. So I think it's interesting just looking at some of these games that will be – just a, a one game conference um, season or series, I should say, um, is very uh, is very intriguing. Kind of going going down the line, and you know, I you mentioned Jeff some of the uh, some of the struggles that UCF is, is having this year, which is obviously to be expected. I think Oklahoma and Texas, to a certain degree, are going to have the same struggles next year going into the SEC. There's a there's a period a period there, but. I think one of the biggest questions, just overall, not even talking about this game, um, th- that I think a lot of people around Oklahoma and just are very interested in, who's the third best team in this conference? Like, who who is it? Is it? Um, I mean, it's it's so bizarre that you can make a case for about four or five different teams, right? You'd mentioned Kansas, Kansas State. Heck, you could almost make a case for Iowa State at this point, the way that they've been playing over the last few weeks, how they started against Oklahoma. Um, Oklahoma State, which was, to me, looked like one of the worst teams in the conference. Now, all of a sudden, you can make an argument for them. So I think kind of going down the stretch within the the league, I think is going to be interesting. I mean, I think it would be a shocker to everyone if Oklahoma and Texas aren't playing in the Big 12 championship game. Having said that, you know, what – uh, Texas is notorious for for slipping up against teams that they should not have any business losing to. So, you know, if that happens, 
you know, I think it's interesting to see who's the team that would be more right to potentially slide into that Big 12 championship game should something like that happen. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a great point. I, you know, and, and there's no, you know, there's nothing that says that, you know, UCF couldn't find a way to sneak in if they got yep. hot at the right time. I really do think that UCF, at, at least as of right now, is undervalued. Um, you know, but with three conference losses, it's hard. But, uh, but you know, as, as I said, as I mentioned before, you know, we we saw firsthand Kansas State, very physical football team. Um, they have the size to compete, uh, especially up front. You know, we, we saw that firsthand. Kansas is extremely well coached. Um, they, they, they took it to us right from, right from the word go. And I was really impressed with that football team. So I, so if I had to, if I had to handicap it, I would say that the bronze medal right now belongs in the state of Kansas. Um, which one, I don't know, at least as of yet, I was still surprised at what happened with that Oklahoma state. I think that, I think that the, the atmosphere in Stillwater is probably, cause I watched that game. I thought that the atmosphere in Stillwater pushed OK state over the top in that game. Yeah. Um, but, you know, uh, well, let's see. I'm looking at the schedule right now. Kansas has this week off, and then they have you guys next. So uh, so I guess we're going to find out sooner or later, aren't we? That's right. I just know I got my wish, and that's when uh, the four teams were announced to enter the Big 12. I did not want a clean transition of Oklahoma and Texas leaving the same year that the four new teams were coming in. I wanted a messy, awkward, at least one-year overlap. <laughs> And I got that, and which also produced games like this. Who knows when Oklahoma and UCF will ever play again. So I wanted to see as many of the new teams play Oklahoma and Texas as possible. So I got a few wishes granted here. 